and tattoos on bodies. So it's really fun. <laughs> so I like to tell them all the naughty bits because that's part of my job. Anyway, I haven't a clue why I agreed to do this. I am not even remotely an expert on pottery. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on Moravian pottery, because I only learned about it a few years ago. But I have a few experts in the audience that will help me if I need it. So don't worry. Um, but I wanted to share this with you. Um, my entire life, I've listened to two childhood friends tell me about Ephraim. If I hear Ephraim, 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 Ephraim. And finally, I got to Ephraim, and I fell in love. And when I heard that the Milwaukee Art Museum was going to do an exhibition that was groundbreaking in the world on Moravian pottery, I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> Never heard of Moravian pottery. I don't even know what it means. Uh, but we did a show. We did a show. And I bought, I brought um, one set of catalogs. I had the um, curators of this exhibit very kindly donated one copy of each ceramic journal on the show. And I brought them, they're on the piano. There's a set at the Historical Museum. So if you ever get the desire to look at them, they are beautiful examples and they are the lunatic fringe cutting edge of research on this type of material. Just think North Carolina, Winston-Salem, think about Phil um, not Philadelphia, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, think about that whole area and you have Moravian pottery. The problem is there were so many good clay deposits there and there was so much good material that um, all of these pots and shards that were discovered were all given automatically to the Moravians because they settled this area. The problem is there were also a few Germans there. <laughs> and guess what? We now know that they weren't all Moravian pots. And the archaeologist of this exhibit said in the show, when the Door County ladies come every year to visit me, we go on a tour. And I brought them down to the show, and here was the curator from Winston-Salem, the curator from Milwaukee, the curator from North Carolina, the archaeologist, and the potter. And I said, if I had tried to put this group together for a program at the Milwaukee Art Museum, it would have taken me 10 years, and I couldn't have afforded it. <laughs> but they had the privilege of hearing the best. And the archaeologist said, I don't know what to do. You see this beautiful bowl? This beautiful bowl over here? I borrowed it from the Metropolitan Museum. 20 years ago, ago I sold it to them for a very embarrassing price. And guess what? It's not Moravian. <laughs> now I have to go back and tell them and see if they still want it. It's South German in style. So anyway, that's why I got here. So what I'd like to do is just this evening, just share a little bit of it with you. I can't go into much detail, but um, I just thought living in this Moravian area, a little bit of this goes a long way. And if you want more, it's in the books. I promise you. Okay. And on a, on a serious note, um, I found this wonderful quote in the book which I'd like to share uh, with you if I can read here. Uh, the utilitarian nature of pottery has remained relatively unchanged for over 10,000 years. Now that's a good track record. You know, I always say to the children, you know, this pot is so old you can't even fathom it. If it's 10th century AD, that's young. They don't know what I'm talking about. I said, this pot was made so long ago, and I said, you know what? When you and I go to make a pot, we make it the same way. You can either have liquid clay, uh, like they do in the toilet factory at Kohler. You grab a hose, you stick it into the hole of the mold. Toilet! <laughs> it takes five minutes, and it's porcelain, not pot. 
It's not pot, it's porcelain. So, or you make snakes, coils, and you build them up and then smooth them. Or you throw it on a wheel. Nothing's changed. 10,000 years ago. It's kind of scary. But that's interesting. Anyway, so 10,000 years ago, like our ancestors, we used pottery for storage. We use it for consumption of food and drink and many other activities of everyday life. Since the first clay vessels were hardened in fire, pottery has declined its status. Sometimes we call it craft. That's not a pretty name, I don't think. I love pottery better. And it's functioned symbolically in many different ways, many different belief systems, and for many decorative and religious reasons. Um, in many religious, um, in, excuse me, in any reg many regions, religious regions, pottery is a metaphor for creation. And with the Moravians, they were one of the ones that used pottery for creation. Like clay, this is a quote I found, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you and me in my hand. Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you modeled me like clay. Will I now turn again back to dust? Adam, God made Adam in clay. I didn't think about that. I thought, is that ever bizarre? I love things like that. <laughs> We're made of clay. Now we are, women, of course, came from the rib. The rib of Adam. <laughs> but the men are made of clay. <laughs> Okay, now a little more background. During the last half of the 18th century, potters in Europe and in Britain descended through a wide variety of old world ceramic traditions and brought it with them when they came to the back country of North Carolina. Through the hands and minds of these craftsmen, the most basic material was transformed into objects of exceptional beauty and enduring cultural significance. For the Moravians, it was slipware pottery. Now when I say slipware, this is what I hate about museums. They speak in Navajo code. <laughs> but slipware is just liquid clay, and you can use it. Uh, like you think of decorating a cake. Have a little canvas bag with a little nozzle, and you can fill it and decorate with it. Make loops, circles, Flowers, see those little wiggly patterns? That's all made with, well, this is liquid slip. So slipware plates and dishes, and they were made of symbols of religion and the cycle of life. Now, we, we might not know that, but if we were Moravians and raised in a Moravian household, we would know the value of this plate we have plates that were passed down through eight generations of family already. So you would know the value of this and it would be handed down to a member of the family. Very important. So it's a way of, to me, it's a way of hanging on to your background, your, uh, what do you call it, your roots, thank you, your roots. And, and when, you, when you come over that big pond, it's kind of scary and you want, to preserve something that you had from home. You want something that, that'll talk home. And so by creating vessels that you had at home and decorating them, they could do that. Now, I didn't know this, you probably all know this, but the Moravians believed that the blood that dripped off Christ's body while he was on the cross and fell into the earth from that blood, 
there was a plant, a flower that grew, and it's called an anemone. And so this is an anemone. And anemones are a Christian symbol. So this plate was probably never used except as a piece of decoration in the house, a treasured object for the family, and also, if you're a Moravian, you wouldn't even need to be told that this means Christ lives in your house. His love, his spirit, his passion. So, big deal, right? That's it. That's Moravian pottery. That's as good as we're going to get. Okay. The Moravians who settled in North Carolina were members of this Protestant sect that traced its origin to John Huss. And I heard today I had a delightful tour with Mr. Paul over there. And um, I heard a delightful story about John Huss has just recently been um, pardoned, ended up pardoned right. by the church, yes? I'm very pleased to hear that because it's not fun to burn at the stake. <laughs> a Bohemian martyr who was burned at the stake in 1415 because he wanted to do this Moravian religion. And it's so simple. You know, you could reduce it to one word. Love. Can we do that? No. We can't. No, no, we can't. It's pathetic. His followers subsequently formed the Unitas Fratrum and spread their faith across much of Eastern Europe. And in 1722, Nicholas Lewis, Count of Zinzendorf, allowed members of the Unitas, Unitas Fratrum to settle on his ancestral land in Saxony and to establish a town called Herrenhut, about 60 miles east of Dresden. And I've been through there, folks. It's very exciting. I didn't see any Moravians. <laughs> During the second quarter of the 18th century, he became the Moravian's principal spiritual leader and uh, became their sort of go-to guy. Orthodox Lutheranism played a role. They were quite close. And the Enlightenment and so on with the theology. So Bethlehem became the first um, important town that was established in North America. Uh, and as was the case with Heron Hut, Bethlehem was uh, closed to outsiders like me. I couldn't go there. I could visit, but I couldn't, I couldn't own land and I couldn't build a house there. The church controlled the land and uh, the lease system and regulated the spiritual, social, and economic affairs of the community. So, same with Wachovia. So now let's go to the um, next slide. I found this incredible, I have a very overactive imagination. So when I see a picture like this, having studied pots most of my life, I look at that bowl and I say, my goodness, there's that famous bowl again. Sometimes it's known as Paul Revere's Bowl. Sometimes it's the Liberty Bowl. Sometimes it's a tea bowl. Sometimes it belongs to a special person like the Emperor of China. But isn't it a classic? And I bet every single one of us in this audience has a bowl like this at home, in one color or another. This is what I mean. About 10,000 years ago, they made them just like this. And of course, you've seen a little bit of a shard there, uh, or what's left. And uh, this is what they find, and this is what they examine, and then they uh, figure out all the different components. Okay, Kevin. Now, this is fun, isn't it? it took me a long time to find Christ. That's a, holy moly, what is this? This is a tree, no kidding. Uh, an illuminated manuscript commissioned by Frederick William Marshall in 1775 provides a compelling evidence 
that Moravians understood the power of symbolic art in the communication of religious beliefs. Christ's blood saturates the ground below a flourishing, flourishing grapevine whose leaves depict many Moravian congregations around the world. Inspired by John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches, and you can do nothing. Whenever about, when, whoever abides in me, and I am in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you are nothing. So, here's the visual metaphor. And these, I think they refer to, Linda, correct me if, I wrong, if I'm wrong, as choirs. These were like groupings that they knew of in Europe at the time. And they called them choirs. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Okay. Next one. Now, this was my favorite thing in the show. And it was kind of the lead, lead in panel when you went into the exhibit. And it's the earliest known shop sign uh, that we know of made in clay. And it belongs to Gottfried Aust. And he opened his shop in 1773. And he's put this on the edging of his, the rim of his plate. And right here, if you're sensitive to designs, embroidery, lace work, needlework of any kind, um, or flowers, or flora and fauna, Remember, most everything that's been, ever been created is either flora and fauna or abstract design. But if you look at this and you've been doing your homework, you say to yourself, wow, that looks pretty impressive, the designs. The bird you can find in Isnik material in Turkey, Islamic kinds of plates. You can find the flowers in France in a lot of French design going back to the 17th century and coming through. The abstract design patterns you can find all over Europe. And wouldn't you have fun making this like you're decorating a cake with all these squigglies? I just think it's beautiful. And then the ground, the background, is this kind of wonderful, I don't know, Frank Lloyd Wright would call it Cherokee Red, because that's what he did everything in. I call it Chinese red. The Pennsylvanians call it red web. So I don't know, but isn't that beautiful? It's about this big, you know? And it's in mint condition, and it hung on his wall, his sign. This uh, shop sign is the earliest documented object made during Aust's tenure as the master of the pottery in Salem. The date on the Marley, the Marley is just the term they use for that brim going around, the Marley. God, I always have to use these terms that don't mean anything, you know? <laughs> the date on the Marley relates to the directive from the elders' conference to place proper signs at the houses of tradesmen so people knew where you were, what you were, and who you were. Um, if it was a tavern, I think everyone got it. <laughs> um, it's over 20 one inches in diameter, and it is the most elaborate and technically complex piece that the German people um, had in this country, and I think still is considered such. Okay, now we can go to the next one. I threw this in because, and I even brought along an artist friend of mine by the name of Joanna Paleman who um, works with botanicals, and she works with um, flora and fauna her whole life. And um, this is a, a recent work that she did on tulips. And oh, thank you. Thank you, team. And um, I looked down below, and by God, it says, homage to Jacob Marel, who is an artist in Germany. There's that painting, that's his. And the Moravians loved Northern realism as opposed to Southern. Southern would be Italian 
and a little bit woofy and schmoozy and all over the place and all curves. And up north, it's like one hair is on your brush. And um, you can't tell if it's, you know, something to pluck off. It looks so real. And the Dutch in the, the lowlands, Belgium and Holland and all those places, these artists were trained to paint realistically. And they did it so well, you would know the genus of every flower. And then, of course, you have to know they cheated because when they did wonderful displays like this, they sometimes put flowers together that didn't come in the same season. But they're hoping that doesn't count. Okay? So, but they are known for this. They're known for optically designed things. The telescope, the microscope, they did all of that. You'll see spectacles on Jan Van Eyck's bishops. And you'll say, they didn't have glasses then. Oh yes, they did in the north. And then remember the camera obscura, the camera uh, lucinda. Remember all those widgets and gidgets. So you can come up and look at this, but the Moravians had such good taste, they liked to copy the northern uh, Renaissance painters. So I had to throw this in to show you. Um, and next to it is one of the most famous goldsmiths in the history of our time here, a Harlem engraver and a painter, and he came before Franz Halls, but he looks like he came after because doesn't he look kind of feminine and wild and, you know, the curls and the feathers and you don't know where to look. But if you look closely, you'll see a tulip. See this wonderful tulip? You'll see an hourglass. Ha ha ha. And you'll see a skull. All sorts of, gosh, the symbolism. The skull can be the symbol for life or death. Most of us think death. Shouldn't. You should all think life. Because if you're a Christian, and remember the Moravians, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Christ, you will live forever. And you will exit this form, and you will live in another form. So it's a reminder that you're not going to die when you see a skeleton. You're going to live on. And we have a painting at our museum of St. Francis of Assisi, two years before he died, looking at a skull. He's holding it. His hood is up, so you can't see his face too well. But he's looking at it because he knows he's about to die, but he also knows he's going to live forever. So it's a double on top. It's a, it's a trick. And of course, we all go around, oh, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. And you don't have to do that anymore. We have a solution. So, he's carrying that. The tulip, of course, I don't know what that symbolizes. Everything. Uh, talk to the Dutch. And then the hourglass is again a reminder of time. Time's running out. Do the best you can now, and we'll take care of you later. Okay. Kevin. Now, just so you don't think I'm not so, I found this painting in the catalog, and um, this documents the anemones growing up around, of course, they're a little far from the cross, aren't they? <laughs> Never mind, that's poetic license for painters. But you see all the anemones here uh, as that symbol for Christ. And of course, they're in the costume of the 18th century, which is kind of nice. Okay. Now here's another one. It's kind of fun. This is in a painting I'm not showing you because it's, I don't like it. But I like the fact that they have the little anemones on the drapery of an angel. So I put that next to the plate so you could see it. Now look what's happening. Those dipsy doodles on the Marley are becoming, that's very modern. I saw something like that in a pottery shop uh, in Door County the other day. See this kind of stuff? Doesn't that look modern? Okay, I just want to make sure you're awake. Okay, <laughs> okay Kevin. And there's another beautiful dish. They call them dishes. 
what an unattractive name. But I'm sure this was never used. I'm sure this was displayed. It's in mint condition. And I love the colors. And it would look nice in a lot of people's homes. Okay. And a couple more dishes for you. Um, now, the marley, it's kind of broken on that, but do you see the pomegranate? <coughs> this is a pomegranate. It's not very good. There, there are betters, but I couldn't find one to show you. And these designs are, are quite wonderful. We're getting into some things that are very sophisticated. This one uh, has some damage, but never mind. Okay, so let's go to a painting that you all should know because it's so famous by Botticelli and it lives in Florence, Italy, in the Uffizi. And it's called the Madonna with pomegranate. They always have that. It's unusual. You know there are people that believe that what Eve gave Adam was not an apple. <laughs> so, the pomegranate is very popular among the Moravians, the South Germans, etc., certain parts of Europe. So I just thought I'd show you. And I wanted to read to you a little bit about the myth. Um, the myth of Proserpine, the goddess of the underworld, also prominently features a pomegranate. In one version of the Greek mythology, she was kidnapped by Hades. Oh boy, wouldn't that be fun? And taken off to live with him in the underworld. He wanted a wife, so he just took her. And her mother, Demeter, or Demeter, whichever you say, goddess of the harvest, was hysterical. She mourned and mourned, and she had lost her daughter, and all the green things had gone and stopped growing. She was just beside herself. So she went to Zeus, and she said, you got to do something. You're the highest ranking poopa in the heavens. Will you please get my daughter out of Hades? So he said, OK, I will allow her to come to the earth six months out of the year. But the other six, month, six months, she's got to go live with Pluto in Hades. Why? Because he tricked her. Hades tricked her into eating six pomegranate seeds. Okay. <laughs> Don't you love it? I tell you, they can make these stories up. I can't even make good ones like this. So anyway, so she comes back. Now, never mind, we have four seasons. You know, we have, so we fudge a little with the two, winter and summer. But anyway, that's, that's one theory. Now I want to read you another theory. Now, I have a Jewish friend who really shocked me the other day when I was talking to her about doing this for you. And she said, um, well, you know, they have a symbolic meaning in Judaism. I said, no, I don't know that. And she said, it's one of the fruits which the scouts brought back to Moses. They kept running ahead and bringing them back to, to prove to his people how fertile the promised land was. Of course, that's who we wash. And then we have in the book of Ex Exodus, um, the, the high priest had engraved, not engraved, embroidered pomegranates on his beautiful robes. And you do see on religious vestments, pomegranates, okay? Now, if you go back, it's kind of interesting because um, it is traditional to consume, consume pomegranates on Rosh Hashanah uh, because the pomegranate with its numerous seeds symbolizes fruitfulness. Also, it is said to have 613 seeds. Now, there's a piece of trivia you need. <laughs> and it corresponds with the 613 mitzvahs, or commandments, in the Torah. Why did you know that? I never heard that. I said, I'm glad I don't have 
Ten Commandments is about all I can handle. <laughs> 613 is a bit much. <laughs> so um, anyway, I just had to add that. Well, the Moravians, for religious reasons, love the symbol of the pomegranate too. And um, it, it stood in for Christ himself. OK. Now we'll look. Now, if I had something I told the curator, if there's something missing from the show, I haven't. And it would have been this darling little covered sugar bowl. I just loved it. I love the shape. The shape is still around. I love the glazing. I love it. Don't, now, don't yell at me, but it reminded me of the Chinese glazing that occurred in the Tang Dynasty on the camels and the horses the way they did these wonderful earthly tones, and I just loved it, and it's a gem. So um, this was uh, one of the popular things. And what happened is a gentleman by the name of Rudolf Christ came to run uh, Gottlieb Aust's um, um, pottery, and he was trained professionally and had a lot more glazing um, recipes and uh, really made a, a big change. When he came, he brought with him the next level higher of craftsmen. Okay, Kevin, yeah. Now, just to show you that some people brought their stuff with them. You know, you, don't, you can't forget, you know, people say, well, why are you showing a Spanish or a Dutch candlestick in an American period room? Well, it's because, you know, when the Dutch came, they brought the candlestick with them. That's okay, you're allowed to do that. But then we also make candlesticks. So they brought with them some of these wonderful cream wares from England. So they found these shards also in this area, just to make it a little more confusing. Okay, and this thing, I always saw these things, I never knew what they were, let alone how they were made. And honestly, I, I'm not gonna bore you with telling you how it was made. But if you're interested, Michelle Erickson, who was the potter, um, during this show, we had a little video of she's made copies of all these so she can better, so her husband, who's the editor of the Ceramics Journal, can better write how these things are made. And it's very tricky to make one of these. And um, this one is very beautiful because it has that beautiful, um, I don't know what, aqua, aqua, bird's aid? bird's egg blue kind of glaze on it. So it's, it's a very beautiful piece. And um, it's called faience. Now we get very complicated when we get into all these names. There's faience, there's faenza, name of the city. There's majolica, there's majolica. There's um, tin glazed earthenware. And then there's Delft, capital D, small d, and I can go on and on, okay? It's all the same stuff. It's just different clay deposits, different countries, different languages, different names. But you see it all over the world. It's still popular today. It's the uh, ability to put a colored glaze on top of a clear glaze on top of a fired piece of clay. So if you go to a pottery up here in Door County, they may say it's lead glaze. They use oxides of lead in it. It could be tin glaze, which is famous for the Delft. The Delft people walk away with that one. And they're all copying and imitating Middle Eastern and, and Asian pottery, all of it. So uh, this is just what they call tin glaze or faience. Oh, brother. Okay. <laughs> now this, we think, but I'm not sure, may have been molded off a real turtle shell. You know, they took the turtle shell and then they pressed soft clay into it, connected it carefully, fired it, and uh, there it is. Now, the Moravians, God love them, love little creepy crawlies. They loved squirrels, they loved fox, they loved turtles, they loved fish. I'm wearing my fish. This was made for me for my 70th birthday. 
by a Moravian silversmith in Winston-Salem. And the curator um, who did this show, Johanna Brown, had one on at the opening and I, I almost broke it off her neck. And then, the, as a surprise, the staff at the museum commissioned the same woman to do mine. So I'm wearing a Moravian fish. You can come see it. Okay. Now this is a wonderful little squirrel. And they come in two sizes, small and large. They're called bottles. They're made of, you know, all kinds of animals and humans. They have a lot of women. I, there was an Indian, but we never saw one. Okay. And here is a fox with a dead chicken. And he's on the cover. He won the Medal of Honor. So we put him on the cover of the journal. Yeah. Okay. Another beautiful example. Uh, more flowers, more decoration. It's getting a little more sophisticated. Okay, Kevin. Now, what is this? It's kind of different, isn't it? Or maybe you don't see it. Didn't, I didn't see it in the beginning, so I'm not going to punish you. But it's different. First of all, it's very dark. Very dark, very black, very dark brown. And it's got these, uh, well, it does have a kind of a plant life, a little bit, but it's abstracted. And so, look at the marley, it's all abstract. It's like a pool cube with the balls in it that you're setting up. Okay. And here's a flask. Now, Paul, this is not quite what you pointed out today with the star, but there's a star. We saw it in the Moravian church. Um, but anyway, here's a star. And I threw this picture in of this young lady because um, I know you'll just die when you hear this. But I'm a Huguenot. I call them the huge knots. And the Huguenots were Protestant French. And what I didn't know about the Huguenots is most of them were tradespeople. They were printers, they were potters, they were weavers, they were goldsmiths. Paul Revere is third generation, third generation goldsmith. Unfortunately, he could barely use silver because 75% of his inventory were buckles for shoes, bridges, and the rest were buttons. So he didn't get to make many teapots. They were too expensive. But the Huguenots were these incredible craftsmen that belonged to culture. And guess what? A lot of the Huguenots came to our country and settled in this area where the Moravians were. So there's something they learned from the Huguenots in their trade. And they think this cross got passed on by the huge knots. <laughs> so there it is. And I just thought, because this is the way my mind works, it's a little dingy. But you see, there, here's the Huguenot cross. OK? OK. Now these, you know, when I was growing up, we went through museums. What were these called? Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> Not Deutsch, Dutch. So I grew up thinking they were Dutch. But Deutsch is German. So now we have to relearn the name. Pennsylvania German, please. Craftsman. And Linda, look at the design on here. Yeah. OK? And um, these were wonderful chests, probably made for a wedding or a dowry or whatever. And highly decorative. And you've got a lot of whistles and bells going on here. You've got beautiful architectural kinds of I was admiring these, I don't know if they're paintings. I was asking Kevin, you see all those things on the back wall, uh, on the side wall? It's the same kind of thing. They had these things, but sometimes the panels went on a chest, other times on the wall, and uh, they're just exquisite. And if you paid a lot of money, you could have all six boards decorated. If you were cheap, you would just maybe have the front done. It's what's up, 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 it's what's up front that counts, right? You pay extra the minute you move. So sometimes the back legs weren't even carved. You'd have nice, beautiful, bun feet on the front, 
you go to the back and it looks like my mother's clothesline on Shepherd Avenue. You know, it's like this, and you put the rope in, you know, and then it all falls on the ground, and then you get a spanking. <laughs> okay. Now look at this. Look at this. It's getting to be more abstract and sophisticated. This is a very sophisticated design. I'd love to own that pot. I would kill for that pot. It's just beautiful. And I love the way they've done the stems and the little patterns that are all around it. It's very abstract. I love it. Okay. There's another one. There's another sugar. There's a sugar pot. Again, it's got that black. So guess what, folks? We're in the German territory now. We're in South Germany coming over to the area. So it's different, and it was clever the way they did the show. I don't know if you remember it, but you went in, and if you stood in the middle of the show, Moravians to the left, South Germans to the right. And you'd stand there, and you'd see all this dark brown, black, and over here all this light creamware with the anemones and the little animals. Okay. Four wonderful plates. Look at that. Now that's as sophisticated as anything I've ever seen. I just love them. And I know these were never used. There's a crack. And you know doggone well that was Grandmother Brown's favorite thing. And she saved them and she preserved them and passed them down. And they're big. You know, they're big. And of course, you know, the Dutch had sets of five Delftware hoo-hoos, pitchers, faces, cream jugs, whatever. Some of them in Chinese style, Ming Dynasty style. But these, look at, they're, they're almost entirely abstract. You can feel nature a little bit in some of them, but it's amazing. Okay. You know, now it's pointed out and say, oh yeah, why didn't we catch that earlier? Well, we're not archaeologists. There's that famous bull from the Met. I've never had the courage to ask Rob what they said. <laughs> so anyway, another sugar. I mean, these are really wonderful. Look at that red. That is a Chinese red. OK. Oh, boy. OK, Kevin. Now this. This was my other favorite. This came from a wonderful potter by the name of Lloyd. And look at that spatter. Is that back? You bet. Back, it never left. I love it. And that's about so big. So go home and get out all your decorative plates. And display. Okay. And this is my last slide, Kevin. This is my last slide, Kevin. Um, now I looked at this, and you know what I thought? Native American. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Oh my God, you're wonderful. <laughs> you're wonderful if you feel. I just, I don't know why, but Paul told me today, he said they got along with people. So I'm sure the Moravians got along with the natives. And they accepted them, right Paul? They accepted them, they didn't care what color you were and nothing. So I'm sure there was, um, the influence uh, in that area. Okay, those are my Moravian pots and my South German pots, and I'll try to, if you have any questions, I will try. <coughs> oh, bless you, and thank you.
was used by the Etruscan people in Italy before the Italians came in, after the Greeks, what's the word I'm missing? Yeah. Before the Greeks, I think. I can't remember, I'm confused now. But anyway, they used black clay to make vessels, and we have chalices, we have dishes, we have pitchers, we have covered sugars, we have all sorts of wine jugs. So you have what I call the creamware color. It can go from white to cream color to uh, orange to red to black to gray. And then you have um, stoneware. And the uh, Moravians made a lot of stoneware. Those were more for the, you know, the potties and uh, the water vessels and things that were a little more for the barn or the outhouse or something like that. And then the, the finer pieces, the kitchen things that they cooked in and everything, um, that was a good material to use because stoneware didn't always break. And so they're just different, it's, you have to learn about the clays, you know, and then you have to learn about slip and using how you use slip and it's so much fun. You could make wonderful slipware stuff. And then you can get fancy and you can get into um, glazing. You know, when you glaze, it puts a shine on it. And when you see enamel colors, that's pulverized glass. Enamel colors. I used to do that at camp. We'd have them in little spice jars and we'd tap it out on a piece of copper, put it in a little toaster oven, melt the glass. I burned mine all the time. Charcoal cufflinks for my dad. You know? <laughs> Don't give me your s'mores because my marshmallows are always charcoal. But if you know how to do it, you pull it out just as the glass melts. And, um, and then you, you learn how to manipulate that enamel. Well, when you see some of the Middle Eastern cloisonne, or as the British say, clausens, uh, when you see cloisonne, that's enamel. And it's poured into a little trough. It has little gates all around it, so it can make all these designs. It's just a matter of the material. So clays just come in all sorts of colors. What about green? Well, green is usually from oxides of iron or manganese, or uh, it's usually in the glaze. Yeah. I don't know. Is it green clay? I don't know. I've seen. Oh wait. No, I've seen blue clay red clay and brown clay in China. They make little tea wigs that go to the south of China. Okay, yeah, there is green, you're right. China, South China. Look for the little teapots. As a matter of fact, I have one I can show you at home. Oh boy, I'm glad I woke up to that. <laughs> that was a close one. Okay, yes? Have you seen Maria Martinez? Oh. I ever. I love the work. Maria Martinez, the Pueblo style pottery. She's famous for um, her black clay. And it's fired at a very low temperature with cow pies. <clears throat> she builds a little thing and burns cow pies. And then she polishes the parts that are cut. She cuts some of them with onyx and, and polishes the designs. Yes, yes, in the yes, in the cow pies. Right. Must be a very good aroma. <laughs> yeah, but it's you'll recognize them because they're black and they're sort of a matte. And then when you see the part she's polished with the onyx, it's bright, shiny glaze. Yeah. You know, and it took a lot. Yeah. Yeah, she bit hand builds them. No no wheel. Yeah. Very famous potter. You know, you won't believe this. Should I tell you? I found one in the good little shop. Oh. And I bought it for five dollars. And I took it to Santa Fe. And they said it was a Marie and I said it's yours. Oh. I don't want to own a Maria. <laughs> it's too scary. I can't use things like that. Being a museum person, I can't deal with that. I'm down Oklahoma. You do? Okay. 
Anything else? For sure, I have thousands of questions. Just kidding. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, one more. Yeah, the rack. Yeah, the little design. It's a triangle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we saw that in the Sacramento Familia. Oh, Sacramento Familia by Antonio Gaudí. Woo, I love him. <laughs> love Gaudi. He did these. Uh, he did a cathedral which he, he died before he finished. It was hit by a streetcar, and they're now finishing. They look like pizza cutters. They go up and they have this pizza cutter thing in the middle, and uh, he has these wonderful, um, sort of baroque, theatrical, uh, very active um, designs. But they're trying to finish it, but no money. It should be done. Yeah. I saw Darth Vader for the first time in his cathedral because um, he did these um, figures uh, like um, a nativity scene. And if you look at the costumes on some of his characters and the masks, they look like Darth Vader. I know where Hollywood gets all its in. in Listen, I found that out. All the animators, all Pixar, Disney, where do you think that comes from? Are historians. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. yeah, it's true. I do not tell a lie. <laughs> yes. Well, it could be. It could be. Yeah, you know, with Gowdy, he was so creative. Amazing man. And he picked up all the shards of ceramic tile makers and pots. And he embedded them into a kind of a concrete and made benches and tables and market stalls. And you could go to his park. It's called Parque Guell, G-U-E-L-L, -L, Parque Guell. And you can visit. It's three tiers. And he has a dragon. It's a fountain. And he used, those are all made from throwaway shards of pottery. So he recycled. He was very good <laughs> before we did. Yes? Um, I'm just wondering uh, the difference between uh, when you talk about Moravian potters mm -hmm. and Moravia being a certain area of Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. that of course went along to the Holy Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, then when we get down to southern Germany and see the area, mm -hmm. or, are we still common some of that Moravia? Well, some people are. I mean, I probably am because I don't know. I mean, I just got introduced to this material two years ago. The show, by the way, has been traveling. It just closed at Colonial Williamsburg, where it made record attendance for the museum. And it has one more venue, and then it's going home to rest. So, I mean, I have to do a lot more reading about it, but it's kind of hard because half the museums in our country don't know they have well, they don't know if they have Moravian or South German or Egyptian. <laughs> you know, they don't know. I mean, how would you know? It was pointed out, and now it's very clear to me. That's fine, but when I get out of my turf, I probably won't recognize it. But I might! And then you ask. You do your best. Then you ask. So, and I know where to go to ask. Right here. Because <laughs> they'll continue to work on it. Okay, well, don't smoke any pot. <laughs> <laughs>